I think that means I'm live. I think that means we're live on YouTube. And I know that means we're back. We're back for another year. We're back for truly what has become my favorite thing to do. Uh, Clags so very proudly presents another year of queer of color, trans of color conversations. The series that began as a pipe dream. We were sitting in the Clags programming team office and we said, what is it we want to do? What is the thing that's important to us? What is the conversation we want to have? And we really wanted to talk about queer of color studies. We wanted to think about it as a field, as a methodology. We wanted to talk to some of the people whose work we were just sort of constantly obsessed with and chewing over and debating over. And we just wanted an occasion to bring them all together, to get our dream team in a room and just like pick their brains. And we sent out calls and oh, the peoples who said yes. Uh, and so I am so wildly excited about this series. I'm proud of this series. But before we get to that, I would love ever so briefly from my co-chair, to come and tell you just a bit about CLAGS as an institution. And so with that, I will hand it over to my co-chair, Laura Westengard. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Laura Westengard. I am the co-chair of the board of directors of CLAGS, along with James Harris. And I want to welcome you all today for this exciting start to the new academic year and our fresh season of Queer of Color, Trans of Color conversations. Um, I am going to tell you something that I'm really excited about, about CLAGS, and that is over the last couple of years, our board has been working hard on developing a new, fresh mission statement for CLAGS, and it's something that is really meaningful to me and everyone who works hard behind the scenes to bring you this kind of exciting programming and fellowships and other stuff that CLAGS brings to the world. So um, I'm going to read it to you. This is a, a debut and you all are special. So uh, here we go. As the first university-based LGBTQIA plus research center in the United States, CLAGS nurtures interdisciplinary cutting edge knowledge production in queer and trans studies. At CLAGS, we strive for an intersectional definition of queer and commit to merging issues of sexuality and gender with race, indigeneity, class, disability, nationality, colonialism, environmental justice, and globalization. CLAGS is dedicated to maintaining a broad program of public events and online projects for examining and affirming LGBTQIA lives through accessible public programming through fellowships, and through initiatives that join academics, artists, activists, policymakers, and community members in dialogue and conversation. We are committed to radical visions of a queer past, present, and future within and beyond CUNY and on the national and global levels. And it is that future that we turn to you today um, to ask for your support and your help. We can't do this without you. It is so important that we offer free public programming, but we need support from the community and the people who find um, a shared mission along with us. So your support is critical to establishing a legacy dedicated to the study of LGBTQ plus cultural, historical and political issues. So I ask you, please make a donation tonight. We're going to drop a link in the chat. Um, whether it is a gift of $10 or $100, every bit is significant and has a huge impact on the lives of students and our community, both now and especially in the future. So keep an eye out for the link in the chat and welcome tonight and thank you in advance for your support. Uh, Laura, thank you so much. I. And it's such an honor and a joy to work with Laura. I mean, truly, we we become a dream team that I didn't quite expect. Uh, and she's it's just great to have a co-chair who's so thoughtful and so sort of on top of everything. Uh, and so, yes, please do. If you have a moment and any, there's so many causes to support, right? Uh, but we really do try to create space to do the kinds of things that are important to us and important, hopefully, to you. And if that's something you can find time to support, your support is always welcome here. So tonight. Ha, ah, we get to do, again, what has slowly become my favorite thing in the world, uh, where I just get to sit back and introduce you to someone really, really smart. And I seem smart by association because I know them. Uh, and, and tonight is not only no exception, I mean, we're batting a thousand over here. I'm so excited to share with you the thoughts, the work, Dr. K. Marshall Green, 
K. Marshall Green is a shape-shifting Black queer feminist nerd, an Afrofuture, freedom-dreaming, rhyme-slinging dragon sly slayer in search of a new world, a scholar, poet, facilitator, filmmaker, and an assistant professor of Africana Studies at the University of Delaware. Green explores Black sexual and gender agency, health, creativity, and resilience in the context of state and social violence. An interdisciplinary scholar, Green employs Black feminist theory, visual culture, performance studies, and trans studies to investigate Black queer forms of self-representation and communal methods of political mobilization. He combines scholarship, art, and activism in his research on race, gender, and sexuality in Black queer communities and cultural production. He earned his PhD from the Department of American Studies and Ethnicity with specializations in gender studies and visual anthropology at the University of Southern California. Green's a former postdoctoral fellow in sexuality studies and African-American studies at Northwestern University, a winner of the Ford Foundation Pre-Doctoral and Dissertation Fellowships. Green has published and edited work in GLQ, Gay and Lesbian Quarterly, uh, South Atlantic Quarterly, Black Camera, and TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly. He's completing his memoir, A Body Made Home, The Black Trans Love, coming out of the feminist press next summer. Uh, please do keep an eye out. We will keep you posted. The proud founding member of the Black Youth Project 100, where he sat on the Healing and Safety Council. You can check out his podcast, Gender Fails, on SoundCloud or Medium. You can also find him on Instagram and Twitter at Dr. Boy, at Dr. Drummer Boy G. Uh, and I am so very, very excited for you to hear tonight's talk which is gender fails, my gender is black, my gender is love, Dr. Marshall Green. Thank you so much um, everyone for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, I was so excited when you uh, reached out because I have been admiring CLAG since I was an undergrad. Um, and so I've always been like, man, I want to do something with them, but it's never, we never had the opportunity. So I'm glad we have the opportunity now. And this is just the beginning, I hope, of a, a long-term relationship. Um, yeah, you know, I'm 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 a hopeless romantic. Or what I like to say now, I'm a hopeful romantic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um thank y'all everybody for being here i am excited very excited to be sharing brand new work um with with you all um today and so the the title of the talk is hashtag gender fails um my gender is black my gender uh is love and so hashtag gender fails is a podcast that i recently started and um I'm not going to get into that just yet uh, because I want to sort of set the scene. And the first thing I want to do is really just dedicate this space to a few people. And so I want to dedicate this space to my son, Cree. I want to dedicate this space to my good friend, Miss Lucretia. And I want to dedicate this space to my little cousin, Jamila. Uh, those are three people that I'm holding dear to me right now. And I just want to... Um, it's a new thing that I'm doing where I'm just being very intentional about the words that I speak and who I'm speaking them for and in alignment with. Um, so, yeah, so let's 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 get going. And so the first thing we're actually going to do is a little exercise. So let's see. Well, one, let me in the chat. I just posted the slides so you all can have access to them because they all have uh, links in them so you can find some of the stuff that I'm talking about. And then I'm going to try to get this to do the slideshow. Here we go. Okay, so what I want you to do is fill in the blank. I'm going to give you five minutes. And you can fill in the blank with words. You can fill in the blank with images. You can fill in the blank with body movements. You can fill in the blank with whatever it is you feel like you might want to fill in the blank. But this is the prompt. My gender is... So take five minutes and uh, finish that sentence. My gender is, and I'm going to play some music while you all do that. Got to wait for the commercial to end. I don't, I might, I might pause you here, because uh, I think we're going to slam into a wall. 
uh, that I've hit once or twice before, which is I actually think that there's this new thing Zoom is doing where if you try to play YouTube content through a Zoom video, it blocks the audio. Oh, OK. Was it I, I didn't have the I don't have the audio on. <laughs> So I don't know if you give it a shot. Let's give it a shot. And let's see what happens. Yeah. It's, there you go. Oh, OK. Sorry. Hold on, y'all. Yeah. Here we go. I'm gonna sing you a lullaby, and I'm gonna make you feel alright. Yeah. One, two, three, four. Did you smoke today? Have you yet put something on your stomach? On break, and that's what broke all of my faith. But now that I know that it's just life, and not because I'm not living right, and doing what I want to do, make LB slaves a good night. Did you smoke today? Have you yet put something on your stomach? Yeah. It's a sad kick in a I'm weary. Don't apologize, cause it remains in day. You don't have to act I don't know. like you give a damn. And if you did, what could you do? It's not enough to even pull me through. Don't into the brim with every cliche. I need a moment to get away. more minutes. Thank you. That was produced by Mr. Sam Hoffman. Sam's by. So I'm feeling like a bad bitch and that nigga right about now. So uh, count me in, good sir. I'm a bad bitch and I'm that nigga. I don't think you heard me. I'm a bad bitch and I'm that nigga. Just in case you wonder.
All right, let's uh, bring it back in. And um, would anybody like to share back? My gender is. We have something in the chat. Can somebody read what's in the chat? I can't see it anymore. <laughs> I am happy to step in and speak for the chat because there is some great stuff going on here. Uh, we've got my gender is comrade and brown. Uh, mm -hmm. My gender is uh, too malleable to be defined and too obvious to be questioned. Mm, I love it. I love it. Does anyone else want to share? OK, I want to be shy. You're not going to be shy by the end of this. Um, so. The way that hashtag gender fails the podcast, but let me let me do first of all, let me just follow my slides because I get ahead of myself. Um, so hashtag gender fails. I'm gonna give you the origin story, I'm gonna give you the what, the why, and the who. So Hashtag Gender Fails is a podcast slash blog that engages Black folk who represent a spectrum of identities and brings them in conversation around gender, Blackness, queerness, and love. This is a weekly podcast slash blog where you will hear stories from Black people about their gendered experiences in the world. Have you ever felt like you were doing gender well? What is that story? Have you ever felt like you were failing? at gender? How did you know you were failing? So every week you can expect to hear some Black brilliance from hashtag gender fails guests. Every guest is asked nine questions. Those questions are, who are you and how are you arriving? Who are your people? How do you, how do you describe your gender? And this is where everyone responds to the prompt that I just gave you, which is my gender is dot, dot, dot. Also, I give everyone a pre-interview form where they're asked to submit two images. One image is the image that a photo of yourself that you feel like this is my photo, this is my jam, this is the photo that makes me feel good about myself. When I look at this photo, I know I am who I am and I am whole and I feel affirmed and I know my ancestors got my back. So people submit that photo and that's really nice. Um, and then the other photo or image that people submit is an image that is uh, that exemplifies their gender. Um, so that's sort of that was that that is that question. So then uh, we move on to what is one thing you want the world to know about gender and or blackness? Uh, the next question is what does loving yourself look, taste, smell, feel, sound like, and why is that important? Uh, next question: If you could give your younger self a piece of advice, what would it be? And then what are you manifesting right now that you are excited about? Then we get to our sort of title question, which is what are your most memorable hashtag gender fails? A hashtag gender fail is a moment when one does not meet the expectations of normative masculinity, femininity, manhood, and or womanhood. So a hashtag gender fail does not point to an individual's inadequacy. Uh, rather, a hashtag gender fail shows us how fragile and arbitrary the gender binary is. Um, and then the final uh, question that I asked people is sort of how I started um, today, which is who do you want to dedicate this show to? And so um, it has been a really fantastic uh, experience. I have uh, recorded 26 episodes so far, which will complete the first uh, season, which uh, nine episodes of nine of those 26 episodes have been published already. And you can find those on uh, Medium or SoundCloud, which links to those are included in the slideshow. Um, I also have included a list of the different people that I've interviewed. And so there's a range of folks that I'm talking to from all different class backgrounds, um, people who have different genders and sexualities, uh, people, people, yeah, it's, it's, it's all kinds of people. The one, the one thing that uh, sort of is similar about everyone is everyone is a Black person. Um, and so, I mean, one, one example, one interesting moment that I want to just bring to the forefront is uh, I asked my cousin from home, my big cousin, uh, big Eric, I asked him, I said, I wanted him to be on the show. 
And his response to me was, uh, he, he responded very quickly. He said, oh, you know, I'm not trans. So I don't, I think you sent this by mistake. And so I thought that was a really interesting uh, response because actually a lot of the people who are not trans um, and are on my show uh, had that sort of same response, like, oh, I don't really know if I'm the person who should be talking about gender, you know, and I actually, that's one of my whys, actually, because, uh, and it's the last point on here, but I'm going to talk about it first, which is everybody should be interrogating their gender journeys, not just gender variants people. So I found that as a trans person myself, and sort of in the world of organizing and the academic spaces that I'm in, that people sort of depend on gender variant, gender nonconforming trans people to do the work of figuring out the conundrum of gender for us in this world. And I am saying in this work that I'm doing that it is not simply the work of us queer queer gendered folks um, to, to do that work. We all have a gender journey in this world. We all are sort of maneuvering through a really uh, strict gender binary. So what is that journey for every single person? And what does it sort of give us? What is the gift that we get when we sort of interrogate that gender journey from all different aspects, right? From at all these different viewpoints. So uh, back to the story about my cousin, when, when he said that to me, I said, did you look at the questions? And then so he looked at the questions and he said, oh, you know what? I can answer these questions, but these are questions that no one's ever asked me as a black heterosexual cisgender man. And so it was a, a beautiful moment. We had a beautiful interview. I'm, I'm really excited when that one comes out. Um, and at the moment when we talked about gender fails, he talked about being a man who cries and how that is something he ha he's had to contend with um, in terms of his masculinity his whole life. So it was a really beautiful moment. Um, so that's one of my whys. I really want everyone to start to do this interrogation of your gender journey. And the reason why this started is because I have done a lot of work in my life as an organizer, as an academic. Um, through in the name of let's create a healthy masculinity. Let's move from toxic masculinity and create something healthy. Um, but what I've found, and I've, I've worked with a lot of organizations around this, and I'm not saying that work isn't um, important. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it. I think that spaces where people who identify as masculine and pe people who identify as feminine sort of get together on their own and do some internal work is important. But I think the work that we need to do to heal the gendered wound of the binary that has sort of been um, pressed upon us, I think that work we need to do collectively. We can't do it by creating a healthy masculinity or any other sort of synonym of a healthy masculinity that you might create because masculinity is sort of is tied always to the bind of the binary. So masculinity is always going to sit in a way that it is pressing upon sort of always violently encroaching upon femininity. And so because that is the bind that we are caught up in, I don't think that we are going to get to the place we want to go by producing a healthy masculinity. I think we have to think about what is our gendered experience collectively. Um, and so, as I said, a lot of this, so I'm moving to the movement and organizing point, which a lot of this, under my understanding of this comes from my work in BYP 100 and my work in uh, the Brown Boy Project around uh, developing certain kinds of uh, practices of healthy masculinity, right? And so I just think that, I think we got to do something different. I think we got to do something different. And so I just have this little uh, quote from my uh, mentor, Ruth, Wil Ruth Wilson Gilmore, which is theory is a guide for action. And so I just I say that to say that that is the way I move. I don't do theory for theory's sake. So if I'm doing something and it's not sort of related to my people or for my people, then it feels like something I honestly don't want to do. So I feel like part of this work is really grounded in human connection and relationship. Um, and that's that's part of my ethic as an ethnographer as well. Um, so the who, you can see a list of the people um, on, on the episodes. That, that link is there as well. 
So now I'm just going to, if I can, move to uh, let you all hear a little reel that I created um, at that moment where people respond to my gender is. So I have uh, a lot of people who actually responded, my gender is Black. And so I'm going to let you hear a, a snippet of three of those interviews right now. And uh, these are those folks. So there's Janae Nicole Taylor, uh, Rhea Thompson, Washington, and Kazimbe Jackson. And that's who you'll be hearing from in this. Let me just make sure we can hear it. Hi, my name is Kay Marshall Green, AKA Dr. Drummer Boy G or Dr. G. Pronouns are he or they. Thank you all for joining me today on Hashtag Gender Fails, where I'll be talking to some very brilliant Black folk from all walks of life about their experiences with gender or being gendered, if you will. Have you ever felt like you were doing gender well? What's that story? Have you ever felt like you were failing at gender? How did you know? Hashtag Gender Fails opens a space for Black folk who represent a spectrum of identities to be in conversation around gender, Blackness, queerness, and love. Thank you all for joining me today. I am honored to introduce you all to my guest. Let's get started. Again, thank you for joining me. So can you talk to me, like, how do you describe your gender? And maybe you can also talk about the photo you submitted that is that exemplifies your gender in with the, while you do your description. Yeah. Mm, okay. Look, let me see. I need to, I'm like, let me go off video and think about this. How do I describe my gender? As Black, <laughs> I think my gender is uh, a black Washingtonian mm. and that being uh, a place that is impacted without representation, that being cracked sidewalks and red sidewalks that can get you arrested by different types of police mm. because of how many different police are in dc um it's also like the generative very generous um proud loudness of my grandmother mm. yeah <laughs> and the soft and tender oneness of the other one so I think my my gender um, is black. Like it's a part of how I dress, what I choose to do with my body, my hands, my hair, my from my glitter on my face to mm -hmm. the keloids on my ear. It's like. Thank you for sharing that um, gl your glitter with my niece too. She, it, her mom had to take it from her because she said you cannot be having all that glitter on my couch. She tried. To ah! She said, "Why can't I pour the whole thing on me on myself?" <laughs> I love it. Yes, purple <laughs> glitter. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so thank you for that. I love that my gender is black. I just want you to fill it in the blank. Okay. My gender is. My gender is black. You want to leave it at that? It's black. Um, I I I've, I've been trying to think of what the answer to that is, um, but I share when you asked a question about this and I shared a photo with you that is a picture <laughs> of um, a button that I have that says today's gender is an abandoned orange by the sidewalk mm. and somehow those two things feel very aligned to me right um 
yeah so my gender is black let's start by doing an exercise fill in the blank my gender is blank okay <laughs> my gender is uh my gender i mean the the technical term for my gender is trans man um that's how i identify i often have said that my gender is black and i and i say that because i think that gender especially as an assigned female at birth person um there was never a way that i was going to fit into the societal norm of what gender meant for um that type of person uh regardless of if i was cis or um or trans or non-binary um uh bell hooks talks about it in um in ain't i a woman um just like yeah none of us were ever meant to to fit in that mold um and so when i say my gender is black i think a lot of people who are not even trans or non-binary also resonate with it because we're like yeah like at the end of the day um um my blackness is intertwined with my gender i think um mm -hmm. go ahead oh no i was just gonna say what i hear you saying too is that blackness is already outside of gender like I believe it's so. yeah like blackness is our some some people have said um blackness is always already trans or always already queer um really so yeah thank you for that you're actually so you are the third person to respond by saying my gender is black um hashtag gender fails it's a thing um follow the hashtag follow me at dr drummer boy g again i just thank y'all for listening and if you would like to be a guest on this show please write me and let me know if you think there's something i can add please let me know i'm always open to growing and transformation and change um i hope y'all have a beautiful 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 day take care turn up I just had to wait for that part. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's a little bit of um, hashtag gender fails. And someone, I was talking to someone about this project and they were asking me, well, what's your relationship to my gender is? And it's very interesting. I think as an ethnographer, um, I, I as a person who, who collects stories, I think that the gift of being able to sit with people and have conversations with them and get to know things about them is that it helps you to get to know yourself. Um, and so what I've learned through these conversations is that every single sort of way that people define their gender, and there have been so many different expansive ways that people are defining their gender. Um, I have resonated with all of those ways at, at some point in my life. And so I took it, I, I was thinking about my gender is black and what does that mean for and to me? And so for me, my gender is black is also uh, synonymous with my gender is love because black for me is essentially love. Um, and so I wanna share a piece with you as, as we end um, and it's called Loving Black. And this, this piece is dedicated to my comrade, Mark Anthony Johnson, who's an amazing healer and organizer out of LA. Um, and so again, this piece is called uh, Loving Black. My brother calls me black with tenderness. He calls me back to myself. He teaches me black anew like only too few ever do. 
And I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. I wish Black always referred to the love my brother gave to me. Warm and strong, he holds me tight. He calls me Black. What up, Black? And I'm reminded of Black, like the darkness you want to play in. Black, like the sun blazing over the ocean that you just want to stay in. My Black is safe with him, but our Black love isn't safe on this land. And I long to hold his hand because between our bodies, we have the power to create Black magic. Black magic is Black life in the face of so many losses. Black magic is... Black love ushering fathers home even after they done done us wrong. Black magic is black scars that have never received the healing they required. Yet we stand here resilient with all these scars on our backs, our minds, our souls, and our bodies be black. Many of us grow so brave, but we meet the grave before we get a chance to be old and pass down stories once told. But black magic, black magic. And I'm reminded of my brother who calls me Black. Black, like the ancestors who will one day call me back home. We hold with us the dreams they had of freedom and try to build bridges to that place. Black magic. Black magic. Black magic is the ability to dream behind bars. Black magic is the closeness between Black people when we recognize ourselves loving one another. So here's my verse to you. I love you too, Black. You're my brother. So, um, yeah, I'm imagining y'all snapping. No, I'll just like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so this idea of my gender is black has a has a has a history um and so i have some links here for y'all to view at your at your leisure um people who have sort of written about my gender being black and there's very it's very interesting way to think about what it means for someone to say my gender is black and all once you say my gender is black it still has a multitude of meaning so i'm really interested in that sort of uh dynamic nature of what it means for a gender to be uh categorized as black or blackness right um so yeah thank you all so much for today um and Here's some contact info. Uh, this is these are links where you can find hashtag gender fails, and we can open it up for Q and A. I hate. I love Zoom. I love Zoom. Corporate overlords. I love Zoom. It's great. Um, the thing I hate most about Zoom is that like it doesn't give us the ability to all just like pause and clap for this incredible moment. And so you guys can't unmute yourselves. You can't and don't. Uh, but like, you know, in the room, we'll just take a second and we will just vibe and I will do the clapping for us all because my God. I loved it. I loved it so much. I loved it so much. And thank you so much for sharing it. <sighs> It feels so good. It feels so good to be in the space. Um, and it's, I love the Q&A part. I have, if it were up to me, there would, I would kick everybody else out and this would just be my time to ask questions. Uh, but I'm sure everybody else has questions. So I will let them ask their questions, but I insist on going first. And it is the question of the series. It's the question we put to everybody, which is like, okay, so our invitation came, you know, not out of nowhere, but like, on a random day. And the ask from us was, we want you to show up and like, tell us how queer color methodology shows up in your work. Tell me a bit about that. And what is queer of color studies methodology mean to your work? How does it show up? What is its utility? So when I think of queer of color, I immediately go to Rod Ferguson. And when I go to Rod Ferguson, I go to who Rod Ferguson goes to, which is Black feminist. And when I go to Black feminist, I go to Tony K. Mambara, I go to Audre Lorde, I go to Essex Hemphill, I go to Marlon Riggs. Um, and then I come back to the present and I go to Charlene Carruthers, I go to Janae Taylor, I go to J Kazembe Jackson, um, I go to my people who are currently moving and working in what we are calling Black queer feminism, which is not just, like I said, a theory, but it is a practice. Um, it is, it is, it is about, it is not just about, um, saying right you are a thing it is about doing and being um 
that thing and 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 what that thing is what is what is black queer feminism it is something that we all came together in as, as byp 100 and we came to struggle over what does that mean and and sometimes we didn't know exactly what it mean but we knew that we wanted to move in integrity we we knew we wanted to move in alignment with one another we knew we were abolitionists we knew we had some some things that we had in common and i think one thing that was really powerful about us sort of organizing around this term black queer feminism is that many people who came to our organization, uh, BYP 100, were not queer people, were not people who identified as feminists. Um, and many of the folks that I worked with in, in my particular sect happened to be uh, cisgender Black men um, and getting us together. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> it was interesting because a lot of folks, a lot of these men would say, well, I don't really know what Black queer feminism is. I don't really know what that is. But what I do know is that when I'm in this space, I feel freer than I've ever felt. I feel like I can be in my body in a way that I've never been in my body. I feel like I can be curious and explore some things that I've never been able to explore. And I'm, I'm interested in that. So I don't really know what a Black queer feminist is, but I really am about what y'all are doing and I can get with that. And I think that's how we need to move a lot more. It's not about uh, who you say you are, it's about what you do. That's really beautiful. That's really beautiful and incredibly inspiring and just like a, a great list of names to know. Um, we have a, a question from the YouTube. Uh, does my gender is black also imply that race supersedes gender or how are these two working in tandem? Uh, I don't think it implies, I don't think you can take it. Well, one, I think we got to take some spe steps back. So I am specifically speaking to black people in the diaspora right? So that question for Black people is going to be different. Um, it's, a, it's a racialized question because I'm, I'm it's, it's a racialized question, whoever you ask it to, but in particular, I'm dealing with a particular set of people, right? And so we understand that the way that we come to know gender as Black people especially particularly Black Americans, but anybody who has been colonized, right, is that we have been forced to accept a binary that was never really ours. But in order for us, sort of when, when emancipation happened, right, in order for us to prove ourselves as human beings, we first had to pr prove ourselves as men or women according to what these Eurocentric folks said a man and a woman was. How we was living was different. We, we already did things different, um, but we were trying to be human. Um, and I think what I like about the podcast and what I'm hearing from different Black people, right, is that we already know we're human. We don't need to fight about that. Um, I'm okay with being an alien. I'm okay that <laughs> that my gender is black, and and you might not understand that because so one of the things is it's not race supersedes gender. Is that we can't understand a black person. We can't we can't understand black gender without the blackness. They're 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 so interconnected. So blackness. Some people will talk about ungendering, right? That happened uh, during 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 the Middle Passage. An ungendering occurred. Um, and so we became a, a different kind of being, really, uh, a different, a, we weren't, you know, we weren't really seen as human. One, we were seen as objects, but we never thought we were objects. Anyways, let me not go off on that. <laughs> I hope I answered your question a little bit. Uh. <laughs> I felt like that was a beautiful answer. And I will encourage people to throw their questions out, really, because if you have questions, <laughs> here's the place in the space. I have a bunch more, so I'm just going to keep going. Talk to me about the podcast. Why podcast as medium? Uh, as opposed to? Yeah, I mean, I guess so we're academics, right? The thing you're supposed to do is a book and so or a journal article. And so, like, why isn't this that? Well, you know, I'm a bad boy. Um I have never subscribed to what academics are supposed to do. I mean, the whole reason I became an academic is because I was told that it would give me some financial security while I was trying to be an artist. So <laughs> nobody told me I had to deal with all these other loops and hoops. Um, 
<laughs> so, you know, I still don't have an academic book. My book that's coming out is not on an academic press, and I've gotten a lot of flack for that. Um, but I'm making a book that is for my people because the things that I'm doing is not really for tenure at the end of the day, is not really for the academy. The academy is a tool and a resource for me to do the things that I want to do. It gives me a lot of privilege, it gives me a lot of access to things that I wouldn't have access to otherwise. But I'm not here thinking that I. I really, I'm not invested in helping to develop the archive in the academy. I am invested in what does the archive look like when I have 100, 200, 300, 1,000 of these interviews and 500 years from now, Black people are saying, what did my ancestors think about gender? And they can go to this place and say, wow, my ancestors thought so many different things. It's so dynamic. That is what I'm interested in. So it goes way beyond the sort of walls of the academy. I hate the academy. Um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot about this place that is challenging to say the very least. Um, challenging to say the very least. I wanna dry, dill, drill in on this, but I won't because we have another question that's really good and really interesting. It sort of harkens back to what you were saying earlier. And that is, would you assert that black gender is different from white gender or Asian gender and so on and so forth? Absolutely. I have a film called it's Get, It Gets Messy in Here. I made it about 12 years ago and um, you can find it on my link tree. It's in my, it's in my bio and my Instagram. And it's a 30 minute film. And um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's similar to the podcast in that it's an ethnographic sort of journey where I ask people um, about their gendered experiences and I'm focusing on bathrooms, but it really becomes a conversation around race and gender that doesn't happen on uh, cis gender folks body. And so it's a really dynamic conversation and who happened to be in my film, it was just by who, who said yes, right? And that happened to be black folks and Asian folks. So it became this really interesting conversation between how uh, black masculinity is received and how Asian masculinity is received. So when black folks, black, um, mostly these were like trans masculine, people were identifying as studs, uh, different things in the queer masculine genre. Um, and so Black folks who were talking about going to the women's bathroom in these bodies would say, you know, I go to the bathroom and people get scared. People are assuming that I'm coming in there to rape them. There is this like assumption of violence. Now, on the other hand, when my um, interviewees who are Asian were talking about what they experienced in the bathroom, it was things like people would say, <laughs> you know, this person came up to me talking very slowly. Do you know that you're in the wrong bathroom? Assuming that these people don't speak English, right? Um, so there was this, I, this, this, the way that Asian masculinity works and the way that Black masculinity works, it doesn't matter whose body it's working on or in, right? There's something that we can kind of assume about how the, um, the racist world, the, the anti-Black world, the racist world that we live in is going to respond to that. And we, we, I found that when it comes to what we think of Asian masculinity, we think of it as feminine, right? Um, when we think about Black masculinity, we think of it as hyper-masculine. We think of it as violent. So it makes sense that in that film, these folks who... Um, had these gendered experiences, they were not simply gendered, they were also very racialized, right? So yes, um, all of, I don't think we can talk about how one is gendered without talking about race, because race is constantly at work and gender is constantly they're, they're they're simultaneous right and yes i do think it is different for white people it's different for black people and it's different for different kinds of black people and it's different for different kinds of white people right it's going to be different for trump than it's going than it's going to be for you know i don't know joe who lives in where I used to live in rural Western Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> you know, all those things matter. Class matters, location matters. Um, yeah. Do you want to switch gears back to the other thing? Because we have another chat question, which is just, can you share your thoughts on the relationship between artist and scholar? You mentioned Tony K, Tony K. Bambara, no disrespect, and Bambara's concept of the cultural worker came to mind. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Harukudi has a great episode on hashtag gender fails. Y'all should check that out. It is it is up and posted. Somebody said, when is the podcast coming out? It is out. The links are in uh, the slide. You can get that. And so what is the relationship between the artist and the scholar? Whoo, well, I feel like all good artists are scholars, right? Meaning that artists do research. Um, artists are curious. Um, not all scholars are artists, though, I don't think. Um, but maybe, I don't know. It depends on how you think about it. Uh, yeah, so I, I would say that's that's one thing I would say. But also, I just think I I appreciate Tony K. Mbabara for a lot of things. One, she was a great essayist, an amazing novelist, and also a filmmaker. Um, and I think what I love most about her was that she was always invested in healing and what was healing like. And I think that for me, uh, one thing that stands out about this time, this movement for Black Lives Matter, sort of what is what does Black social movements look like in this moment? I think one thing that you can say is that BLM and Movement for Black Lives, our organizations have intentionally centered healing um, as, as part of our politic, as part of our ethic, as part of our birthright. What does it mean to heal? And you know what? That's powerful because if we got the time to heal and rest and then we got the chance to love ourselves and see ourselves. And then when we had that in ourselves, we could see it and do it with and for one another. Um, we are an unstoppable force. But what capitalism does is it doesn't let us rest. It doesn't let us heal. It, it makes us work and go and go and go and go some more <laughs> until you lose your mind. Can I keep drilling in on this relationship between the artist and the scholar? Because I'm just like fascinated and personally like up this hill with you. I don't know. I, I want to push back on this idea that like not all scholars are artists. I think maybe they are. They're just not all good artists. Like, I do think there's like, you know, a world of bad art. Uh, and I do think like at some level, like all, all, all dissertations feel to me weirdly autobiographical. And so I guess I'm wondering like part, you were saying this like brilliant thing I relate to completely about capitalism and how it just like crushes us all and part of the way it does that is by ensuring that none of us have time right like there's no time to grow souls there's no time to grow patience there's no time to learn and I guess I wonder like aren't those constraints plaguing both the artist and the scholar this like imperative to be in some way accountable to capitalism and then like as you're pointing out or sometimes the lie we tell to artists is like we'll go be a scholar because they're somehow better protected from like the sort of like mechanisms of capitalism but it doesn't quite seem like that are true like that's true okay repeat back for me <laughs> well so i guess maybe my question is like what is the way in which like how how to make sense out of this like the capital imperative right like at some level the relationship between the artist and the scholar is like they both have some kind of like need to be beholden to capital right like there's some desire to like create a thing but also inside the constraints of this system that we all agree is like problematic to say the least and i guess i wonder about like how to delineate the two or how to sort of think of oneself as an artist scholar or a scholar artist or like do you think of one as being primary over the other well i will stick to what i said before i do think that all artists have to be scholars because you got to study i don't know if all scholars have to be artists and that's quite all right um that's just yeah <laughs> that's what I that's just what I think look I think we're allowed to feel differently and I think you're right I think you're absolutely right that like there are lots of people who wouldn't think about what they do as art but I guess maybe I wonder about like sort of like and so far as art feels like it's the the name we give to things that are useless in some way right the name we give to the things that exist outside of capitalism oh, that, like well, can't see, be reducible that's, to that's their capital how, value that's not how I think about art Talk to so me. art for me is very connected to movement. And for me, 
you don't the same way you don't do the same way I don't do theory for theory's sake. I don't do art for art's sake because I I don't have the luxury of that. Um, my art is related to my people and my people need me um, just like I need my people. And so I don't just make frivolous art. Um, and to be honest, though, when I say that, I want you to understand that all the, it doesn't matter what I create is never going to be frivolous because I'm making it. <laughs> So I don't know if you get that conundrum, but what I'm what I'm saying is that my relationship to art is it, it's not just something I do for fun because I have the privilege of doing it. It's something I do because I have the honor of doing it because my ancestors gave me some real opportunities to do things that people that I grew up with never got the chance to do doesn't mean they couldn't have done it um but so because I have those opportunities I for me have a responsibility to make art that changes people art that moves people I don't make art just for you to sit there and watch it and go "Ooh, that's pretty I want you to say oh my god let me go examine what accountability looks like for me let me go examine that because I never thought about that. So I, I, I make, and I, I, I do think that people should make art like that. I don't think that everyone has to make art like that or needs to make art like that all the time. Right. Because again, that what I'm talking about, that making process in, in, in relationship to that political desire and want, right. That's, that's tied to a capitalist time. Right. So it would be beautiful if I could sit in my living room and paint the walls and play with clay and not worry about paying my car note and all of this stuff. But I I can't. I can't do that. Um, I mean, I could, but then I would be in big trouble. I would be hungry. I would be I would be without a home. So there there you know, there there are things that you have to consider. I think we're all tied to capitalism and it's it's, it's not something that. It's not something that I'm I'm saying that I'm I'm escaping because there's no way to escape it. Like we're all implicated. Um, what I'm trying to do is figure out, figure my way through it. What can we create while we're moving towards something other than capitalism, while we're moving towards something other than the carceral? What do we create in the meantime? Right. Um, yeah. I don't have a question. I just want to give voice to some of the incredibly brilliant things happening in the chat, uh, which are, you know, not all scholars are artists, just like not all entertainers are artists. Some folks are just doing it for the hustle. And look, amen. When you're right, you're right. Um, I think James Baldwin said something similar about art. Uh, Tony K. Bambara said the role of the cultural worker is to make revolution irresistible. Um, and then someone, uh, Deborani from our board offers, I don't know why, but this conversation is reminding me of what Baldwin writes in the Amen Corner. Music is what you gotta do. Kissing is what you wanna do. But how long can you do music if there's no kissing? And then not an exact quote, right? And so, yeah, all those things. Um, and then, and, and Matt Brim sort of checking in to say, thank you for talking about class and the material histories of our lives and jobs and commitments. Um, this is rich, generative work, and I love so many things about it. Uh, all right, I'm going to leave some space for people to ask more questions while I dive into what has been the most surprising thing about the podcast. So there, uh, I, I would just say there are some moments that were really powerful for me. So uh, an interview that I have that's out with uh, Taviana. Um, I ask everyone, what is it that you're manifesting right now? And I asked her, what is she manifesting right now? And she said, I'm manifesting grandchildren. And I thought, manifesting grandchildren, interesting. Um, Ooh, so she, said, she said, I need you to understand something. Taviana is a Black trans woman. She said, when I say that I'm manifesting grandchildren, that is very significant because it means that I am manifesting my own long life, which I was told was not possible. So that to me is really dope because it speaks to 
Black trans desire for life and love and creativity and, and all of these things. And it really does a counter to this sort of notion of um, no future, you know, that kind of like, we're all dead. Well, the Black people I know want to be alive, you know? Um, and want to to think about what does it look like seven generations from now, right? That's what people who I am in, who I call comrade, that's what we want. That's what we desire. And so I think that's something important to think about. Um, I guess another thing that I would say, ah, Stan, there's so many, there's so many gems, you know, um, I'm trying to think. No, I'm gonna just leave it with that. I think that's a, that's enough. Like, what does it I mean, mean manifesting your your life? I, I think that's beautiful. I think that's I think that's beautiful and really like audacious. Like it's bold, right? It's like it's not just manifesting your life, but it's an imperative to your children, like that you too have to survive. That like none of us get to give up. We all have to keep carrying on. Yes. Uh I have. I mean, okay, we're going to leave some space for other people to ask questions they might have. Um, and, and we've got one. What's it like transitioning into your new role? This was going to sort of dovetail neatly with my question, which was also half a compliment. When we first chatted, uh, uh, sir, you were at a different school in Webster, Mass. And it turns out somebody's just blowing all the way up to a new position at University of Delaware. And I'm so curious, like, you know, we talk about like, we are in the space of thinking a lot about transition, but like one of the things we don't talk about is like, you know, transition through different periods of your life. And this is a kind of big one. Tell us about it. It's a huge one. And I will tell you what, I am grateful. Um, I am happy. I love my department. I'm in Africana studies at University of Delaware. Uh, this is the first time outside of my postdoc that I was hired for what I do and not who I am, meaning they hired me to do film and visual culture, not to be a trans person, um, <laughs> which happens with me. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just feel blessed. Um, you know, when I think about Williams, I say it's a, it was a get out situation and I got out and I'm glad. Look, I, I I feel this deeply. Um, and it looks like we are going to say some space for questions, but you mentioned visual culture. So, of course, I have to ask, what are you watching these days? Oh, my God. You don't know how much I watch so much TV, boy. <laughs> um, so I just watched started and finished this show on amazon prime called sprung which is really interesting um it's about a group of folks who are let out of prison early because of covid um and then it's kind of a comedy and it, they're they end up you know robbing and scheming and you know they're just trying to come up uh, but I really am interested in, I love sitcoms. So I grew up on sitcoms like 227, um, Amen, stuff like that. And so I love, I like to look at the sitcoms now because they're very different. So like, I like the Marlin show, um, Blackish, and I'm really interested in the shows who actually took up COVID and like made it a part of the show versus the shows who did not, um, who who just, you know, kept going like it's our sitcom dream world. And I think a lot of the black sitcoms that I watch really took up COVID in a very interesting way. So I'm, I'm interested in that. And then, you know, I have a lot of TV that I can't tell y'all that I watch because you would judge me too hard. But I will tell you one that I watch because I'm going to say that I watch it for research. Um, and that's Law and Order Special Victims Unit. Oh, okay. I'll <laughs> and, allow it. And and I love this show. It's so because it's so predictable. And but what I am interested in at some point, I'm gonna get a research assistant to help me do this. But it's very interesting to watch episode one to the current episode and see how they think about and engage with transgender people because if you look in those earlier seasons everything is tranny there's even an episode where um they allow someone to come in and basically uh assault 
a trans woman because she's trans they were like well you need to see and they let the person fill her up in the it, it was just wild but then for me it's really incredible how they are now these people who are the protectors of trans people and they i'm like what dei a uh, workshop did y'all go to and you didn't tell the audience because what I'm uh, one of the things I'm interested on in is sort of thinking if I'm thinking about knowledge production is like what does it mean to learn and change your mind and put that in writing so people can see how you change over time because we don't stay the same so I want to know if you had a bomb ass theory in 1996 what does it look like in 2023 if it's the same thing then I'm not fucking with you um because you tired but anyways sorry <laughs> but the thing about uh law and order is you you see how this sort of parsing this this relationship between trans and black comes comes to be about there's an episode called the transgender bridge and um there it opens with a montage it's a black boy and a, a white trans girl and so the black boy they open up his house is chaotic the mother's yelling get ready my school and he's running around you see the school the kids are running everybody's chaotic and the white girl they show her family hey honey are you ready for school we love you so much we love our trans daughter she goes to school he goes to school they meet they have an encounter after school at the bridge there's an altercation. The black boy pushes her. She falls over the bridge. It's so dramatic. Um, and so she falls over the bridge, but she didn't die. He visits her. They have this conversation. The people who are sort of trying to defend this little black boy, their defense is that black people are ignorant and they don't know trans people. And so that's why they were acting like that. And so you can't, you can't, you can't fault him because black people don't know anything about transness. And then the, the trans girl dies. And so because she is a protected class, this boy is going to be tried now as an adult, even though they're both middle schoolers. Now, to me, what's interesting is like, how come she is a protected class and he is not? Um, it's very interesting to me. But also this sort of Mm, this this thing that happened with black and gay right which is that we couldn't imagine gay and black together so anything that was gay we think it, it signals white and the same thing is happening with trans and so one uh, another thing that i'll bring up in terms of tv one i love stand-up comedy i love 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 stand-up comedy and if you look at dave Chappelle's special that everybody got all upset about i actually thought it was an incredible set i thought he was really smart um i think what was lacking is that he didn't talk to any black trans people so he did that thing again where everything that he imagined or thought of as trans was white right um and so even he could even imagine and think of right because he talks about having this encounter with these black gay men so we can accept gay people but trans that's white so we have a new outside so i, I think there is I love TV, so we could talk about this all day. We literally can talk about this all day. We literally can talk about this all day. Um, there's a question in the chat that I think it might be better for you to ask yourself if you want, although I'm happy to take it on. I am happy to take it on. You say the word. Uh, but if you would like for if you would like to unmute and ask it, that is also an option. Um, So sorry, I just cannot show my face because I'm wearing a bonnet and I don't look cute right now. Um, so my brain is still stuck on, I'll read the question and then I'll just see if we need to explain further. But essentially, my neuro spicy brain is just still stuck on gender, blackness, and feminism and, and both uh, identifying the ways that they inter interweave with each other and also the ways that they uh, can separate or must be separated. But um, I, I conceptually and materially understand my gender as black. I also can't help but feel that like when I'm hearing it, it also seems to be along the lines of like the argument of like, oh, well, you're black first. Argument no, that's made against that. queer people. 
it's not that at all. Please explain. Please explain. It's not that at all. So when people, what I am hearing people say, right? And so one thing first, my gender is black. Everybody who said it had a different understanding of what that means. So my gender is black does not mean one thing. We can't say my gender is black and then, oh, what's your gender? Black. Okay, I know what that means. No, we don't know what that means. That's why you got to ask more questions. It's the same thing with pronouns. People, people, I get frustrated when people are like, what are your pronouns? As if that tells you who I am. They don't tell you who I am. That tells you one thing. That don't tell you much. But anyways, so what I heard people saying when they were talking about their gender is Black is that there is a way that they cannot understand their gender separate from Blackness. It comes, mm, together. Okay. It, it is, it is born together. So I'm not just a, I'm, I'm never just a man. I'm always a black man. When you see me, you don't say he, him, you say black. Usually, you know what I mean? So that's what they're right. talking. It's not, it's not black first, this first It's saying that I recognize that when I walk in the world, people are going to see me and they're going to see man, but they're not going to just see man. They're going to see black man. And that black right significantly changes what that man means right that black in front of woman significantly changes what woman means so when um sojourner truth says ain't i a woman people often assume that the answer is yes but what if the answer was no what does that mean for black people we might be other things and that's okay Thank you for clarifying. I appreciate it. Thank you for the question. I'm so struck by like the answer to Sojourner Truth's "Ain't I a Woman?" being, but but what if no? Um, that's just really provocative and like eye opening and inspiring. I want to make space for more questions, but I also want to you know make space for us to be tired on a Friday night. Um, and so, if there are questions, Laura, go. Hi, thank you. Um, I was intrigued um, about your sort of interest in visual culture that deals explicitly with COVID that makes space for narratives around COVID and how that has impacted um, the their creations, their storylines, et cetera. And I was wondering how have you explicitly made space for COVID or how has that reshaped your work on the podcast and otherwise? Well, so the podcast is recent, so, um, but my relationship to COVID was that I went, I had my uh, sabbatical when COVID started. Um, I went on sabbatical. So everything was shut down and I'm from California and I, I my plan was to really go back home, but People weren't really flying or anything like that. Um, people were really just staying home. And I was I was taking some risk and I did not stay home. I drove up and down the East Coast for the whole year. I spent a lot of time in Atlanta. I spent a lot of time in New York and Durham. And there were nice strangers that just took me in um, <laughs> in this in this in this wild time. Um, I think that, you know, COVID showed us that there were there are different ways that we can move and relate to work. Um, for me personally, these last sort of five years have been wild, not simply because of COVID, but my personal journey has been um, an acceptance of my own bipolar diagnosis and also having experienced three hospitalizations. Um, during during these times, um, things that I had never experienced before in my life. So I got diagnosed very late. I was 33. Um, and so I think that I, I think being in those hospitals and, and thinking about what does care look like when we're falling apart? Um, who do we have to hold us? Do we have people to hold us in ways that aren't re-traumatizing because the uh, psychiatric incarceration is not fun. Um, it's scary. It's traumatic. And I don't know if it actually moves us more towards healing, but what would it look? I feel like COVID did present us with an opportunity to rethink rest, healing, and holding ourselves and each other. And I appreciate that. 
Thank you. That's beautiful. And I struggle to think of a stronger note to end on. So let's let's do it. Um, I want to take a second and I just want to pause and I want to sit with the brilliance and the gratitude I have for Marshall Green for just all the thoughts and all the things you've shared that I will be chewing over probably the next year or so. Thank you so much. And I really hope that we continue to be in touch because, you know, there's other things I want to do with this that I think you might be able to support. <laughs> oh, please do believe that you'll be hearing more from us at CLAGS. Uh, we've got so many thoughts and feels, not the least of which is that we will see you all back here on October. Wait, let me get the date because I want to say it's the 19th, but I will not be wrong. It is October 19th, which is a Thursday, and we will have our next speaker, Amber Musser. Uh, we'll be back here November 30th with Lou Cornham from NYU. We've got great people coming and all the great people you've already seen, you'll see again. So please, once again, wherever you are in the world, just like a round of applause for Marshall and the brilliant thoughts. Uh, let me take two seconds to hop over to here so I can remind everybody that they need to go ahead and pre-order a copy of A Body Made Home, They Black Trans Love, which is coming out of the Feminist Press next summer. Uh, so you will get another email from that one that, from us when that's happening. And in the interim, go, be warm, be dry as much as that's possible, be safe, uh, and we will see you oh so very soon. Thank, Thank you, you all for joining us. Peace.